Hi, this is Dr. Tony Cooper, and this is Life Without Baggage. In this podcast, I'll help you develop a stronger sense of self, develop firmer boundaries, and also learn how to lean into the gentle promptings of the Holy Spirit who can help you navigate life. I have dozens of bonus videos posted that will help you in these areas and also will help you develop stronger coping skills. In each of the program notes, there's a link where you can request a free digital book, Understanding Your Dreams, where you can find my other media and also where you can find my books on Amazon. Just a reminder before we get into today's episode that this is not a substitute for medication or counseling. If you're having thoughts of harming yourself or another person, or if this material triggers you, please contact your doctor or a mental health specialist to help you with your concerns. I've been a guest recently on some different podcasts where I answered questions that relate to the integration of faith, and coping. In this interview, we talk about the impact of chaos or dysfunction in the home growing up, how it impacts adult relationships in dating, how it interacts with faith, how to interrupt the cycle of abuse, and we talk about coping skills and how to build a stronger personality if you're coming out of some kind of abuse or dysfunction. And of course, we always start off with a little discussion of learned helplessness. This is part of a much longer interview. I've just picked the excerpts. So if you want to hear the entire interview, I'll post a link so you can find the whole episode from Thrive. Now here's today's episode. Welcome to Thrive by the Rising Muse, where faith meets family and mental health. Are you ready to embark on a journey of healing and transformation? I'm Natty. I'm Vita. And, and we, we are, are here, here to thrive. thrive. Today we have a very special guest who's dedicated her life to helping people overcome emotional and mental hurdles through faith. Dr. Tony Cooper is a renowned psychologist, author, and public speaker with decades of experience in the fields of anxiety, depression, and dysfunctional family dynamics. She's here to share her profound insights and coping strategies and how to deepen our connection to God. Dr. Cooper, it's an honor to have you on our show. To begin, could you share with us what inspired you to focus on anxiety and depression and adult survivors of dysfunctional families in your book and your podcast? Well, thank you so much for having me. When I started in practice in 1986, I noticed that many, many clients came in with depression, with dysfunctional families, with trauma in their background. And as I just got to know people and built kind of my professional focus, it's like this is way bigger than I thought. Mm -hmm. So I started to hone in on the idea of what did people need to recover from trauma, to disengage in a reasonable way, not in an angry way, but to disengage from situations in families or even in difficult marriages, to find that balance of being respectful, but also being authentic and being driven by the Holy Spirit and not by what other people say about us or want us to do. That's good. Um, now, one of the things you talk about is uh, learn helplessness. Can you explain that concept to us and how understanding can benefit our listeners? This is not a diagnosis. It's more of a phenomenon. But somewhere in my studies, I came across the concept of learned helplessness. And it's easiest to explain by giving an example. So if you know anything about how baby elephants are trained for the circus, they tie them to a tree or a pole so that every time they try to move, they're pulled back. So mm. this, this goes on over and over until they learn this is as far as I can go. So what happens is when they become adults and they weigh thousands of pounds and they're in the circus, you can keep that adult elephant in one place just with a rope around the leg. It doesn't even have to be tied to anything. Wow, and they will move. So 
it, it's not a big jump to think about how this fits people. Yes. So if you grow up in a situation where there is poverty, chronic mental illness, mm -hmm. chronic medical illness, um, a controlling or angry parent, you kind of learn, this is where I need to stay or something bad will happen. Mm -hmm. So when you reach adulthood, just because you're out of the house or out of the situation, or maybe you get out of poverty, you make some money and you're living well, still those early restrictions, we carry them with us and we don't even know that it's happening. Being a little bit of a geek here, so this is almost like the Skinner theory with the the, the project with the rats that every time they press something, they will get like a, an electric shock, and then eventually, even if they didn't touch it, I mean, they even if they didn't have electricity, they were afraid of it. Yeah, there were studies with dogs. I um, I'm trying to think who did them. Seligman, I think. Uh, if you want to get really geeky, I'll try to do this. I'll try to do this accurately. What happened was they had the dogs in different groups. Some uh -huh. dogs didn't get any shocks. Some dogs got a shock they could control. And some dogs could not control the shock. It started and they just, you know, had to wait for it to be over. And uh -huh. so they combined them in different ways. But essentially what happened was the dogs that did not have any control over the shock, when it got to the point where they could have jumped over this little barrier and escaped, they, they didn't, they didn't jump. They yeah. just stayed and waited for it to be over. Mm -hmm. So what I find is even people who have a strong faith, they may have great faith for other people and mm -hmm. what God will do for other people, but they don't see that the things that they believe intellectually, that there's something stuck emotionally. So it interferes with them really being everything God designed them to be. One of the things that what you're saying makes me think is about a child that has gone through child abuse and because of those conditions ends up in a domestic violence situation because of the learned um, behavior of trying not to kind of like codependency, trying not to um, upset upset the abuser mm -hmm. would condition themselves. And even the, and the, the issue in the faith side of it would be, you know, and I, I can say, you know, oh, you, if you pray enough that the, the abuser might change or the circumstances might change. And, you know, it's the, the faith, the faith part doesn't let them see beyond the fact that God has a better plan for them than an abusive situation or something to that effect. Am I in yeah. the right track? Absolutely. The, the expectation seems to be someone besides me is in charge of my well-being. Mm -hmm. So people put God in charge of things that we have to do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if you want a job, you can pray for a job but you're probably going to have to get a resume and go online and post it, right? Right. And I also like the example of losing weight. Mm -hmm. So when I put on some weight, I can pray, Lord, please take this weight off. But probably I'm going to have to change what I eat and get some exercise. Right. So when we put God in charge of things that we are supposed to take care of, it is kind of our job to watch our boundaries to stay away from situations that are dangerous. But if you're accustomed to an angry parent, and it doesn't have to be the father, it could be the mother, mm -hmm. then when you start dating, you see it as normal when the other person kind of loses their crap. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, oh yeah, that happened. Mm -hmm. And then you just wait for them to get over it. And, and you're so afraid of rejection that when they come back to you, you're like, oh yeah, 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 you know. I'm so glad you don't reject me. And so if that is normal, it doesn't mean you like it, but if that is normal for how relationships work, that you just wait for the anger to go away, maybe pray God changes it. But at some age, we are responsible to protect ourselves, right. make good decisions, right. and um, 
look at our options and not expect God to make things change when maybe we need to make the change. Mm -hmm. This is important because while you were talking, I was thinking about my abusive childhood Mm -hmm. and it was my father. And when I grew up and started dating, I ended up dating a guy who was abusive. Mm -hmm. But on that day that he abused me, I swore I would never be with a man again who put his hands on me. Mm -hmm. I had to go to the extreme to keep from falling in the same trap. Mm -hmm. So I said, no, nobody put their hands on me again. God put me with the sweetest man on earth. Oh, good. He was big football player. Didn't have to hit me. Didn't have to call me names, you know. But I'm glad that I made that conscious decision. Mm -hmm. No more abuse. Because I said when I was growing up, when I grow up, I'm going to marry a man that does not abuse me. I did do that. But on the road to marrying him, Mm -hmm. I saw what abuse was like as an adult. You know, some people say, why am I always attracted to Mm -hmm. alcoholics or drug addicts or, you know, Mm I had to make a conscious decision. No, I I need to be happy the rest of my life and not abused. Mm-hmm. Because my mother was abused. Mm-hmm. But right, yes. what you're describing is is pretty much the norm of how it happens mm-hmm. when people grow up with an abusive parent, or uh, they watch abuse in the family and they say, Mm -hmm. I will never. Sometimes what can happen on a spiritual level is, you know, Jesus tells us not to make vows that um, Mm -hmm. we we can't control those things. Right. Mm -hmm. And it seems as though there are times when we make vows that it actually locks us in to this box where that decision was based on anger and judgment and it for whatever reason, Jesus tells us not to make those vows. It actually locks us into repeating it because we are focused on the dysfunction and not on who God calls us to be. So I can't say I completely understand exactly how that works. But one of the things I do with people is help them identify what vow might you have made in your heart, even if you didn't say it out loud. I will never, they will never, that it can lock us out of good things. And so uh, it's something sometimes we have to repent of. But you're absolutely right, Vita, that um, we have to make a decision. This is not okay. So Mm -hmm. what am I going to do about it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I did because I could have easily been Mm -hmm. in multiple relationships. Uh, that was the same as when I was growing up. And uh, God loves me too much. And that's why I said God loves mm-hmm. me too much to let me go through the rest of my life that way. Good. That's yeah. good you learned that early. Yes. I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I just knew I can't live like this. I cannot. And it gave me an idea of what my mom went through with my dad when she was being abused. That was not a good feeling at all. In fact, I got physically ill. Uh So that's how I knew Mm -mm, I can't do this. I cannot continue. Was it hard for you to get out or was it easy? Was it dangerous? I mean, that's part of it too. Once you figure it out, then you have to really get support. Sometimes you have to, you know, do really extreme things. Sometimes they just let you go. But a lot of times, they hold tight in abusive situations and make it really hard to get out. He tried to, uh, kept calling me. Thank God we didn't have cell phones back then. So I am very, very thankful. And, um, you know, we have coping mechanisms. Uh, can you tell us what are some of the practical ways that our listeners uh, can manage their emotions, especially in challenging times? Yeah, uh, so that comes up a lot. So there's different ways we can do that. It's good if you could talk to someone you trust, of course, getting support. If you're the kind of person that holds everything in, uh, it's going to make it harder to cope. 
it might make you a little more prone to addictive behavior because we're not designed to hold everything in. So being able to talk to someone, uh, a family member, a trusted friend, a support group, a Bible study, but we need to have somebody we trust that we can, you know, help each other. Another thing I encourage people to do is to uh, journal mm -hmm. the troublesome emotions. When we journal, sometimes we recognize things we're saying to ourselves that are garbage. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know a lot of times uh, my clients tell me they start to journal and then they think, they say, I don't even believe what I just wrote. It's like, I don't really believe that. But sometimes we have to see it. We have to bring it into the light. And then when we look at it, maybe it's a distortion and we're just going to be, okay, well, that's not really what's going on here. And we can sort of move forward. Other times, maybe there is something painful going on. And so then we want to think through. Uh, we don't just want to stuff unpleasant emotions, sadness, discouragement. Uh, we want to process it. And uh, then make our decisions about what we're going to do. So I'll tell a story about myself. This is one I share sometimes. So I play pickleball. I play with a group that's pretty good. So I lose pretty often. <laughs> that's okay. And uh, so sometimes it's like, okay, so I, I played as good as I can. That's all I can do. But other times I get mad. And it's like, this is silly. This is a game. I'm not, you know, it's not like there's money involved here. I'm not going to lose my job. And so sometimes I have to work with myself because that anger is based on perfectionistic demands I'm putting on myself. It's like, I'm not going to play good every day. And I'm not going to win very often in this group. These are my friends. And so I sort of like, okay. But I have to do this on a regular basis. And some days it doesn't bother me at all. And other days it's like, okay, this is irrational. So I need to know, yes, this does not make sense. I don't need to go off on anybody. This is something inside of me. And so I'm going to work with it. I can take it to the Lord and I can say, you know, Lord, I still need some healing in these demands I place on myself. If I know where something starts, I can choose to forgive. Lord, when I was growing up, you know, this teacher or this parent or this coach or whatever bullied me, made me feel like I wasn't good enough. So we can choose to forgive and then release at the cross. Most of us know that we take our sin to the cross, mm -hmm. but we can also take the sin committed against us mm -hmm. to the cross. So, Lord, I release to you this, you know, you, I choose to forgive this person. I release them to you. And uh, it it, it kind of takes the layers off. Sometimes it's dramatic, but other times we just have to move those layers off. And then we also want to really watch how we talk to ourselves. A lot of us talk smack to ourselves, things we would never say to someone we love, to a mm -hmm. child, to a partner. So anything we wouldn't say to another person, we really have no business saying that to ourselves. So you want to try to interrupt it. You want to try to clean it up because that helps us build confidence. It helps us live in a state of joy. You know, a lot of Christians spend a lot of time striving. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not good enough. Yes. I don't pray enough. Yes. God isn't happy with me. And it's like, no, God is probably pretty happy with you. We can all improve. Mm -hmm. But it's generally how we feel about ourselves right. that we, we are projecting onto God. Okay, you need to speak highly about yourself and not bring yourself down. But that that's also um, a form of low self-esteem too. Sure. You know, and some things are such a habit, you don't think about it mm -hmm. when you say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sometimes after, you know, we really delve into this, the Holy Spirit starts to nudge people and say, mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> so that we learn to do it for ourselves to read, you know, that God doesn't want us talking smack to mm -hmm. ourselves either. So um, he's very good that he's just gently, you know, like if I have a negative thought about myself or somebody else, you know, the Holy Spirit just like, mm. 
I was like, okay, I repent, Lord. That's not right. And, yes. you, know, you know, I'm doing the best I can. We that's do. important. That's yeah. good. Active. So another topic that we want to explore that you um, wrote about is toxic guilt. Mm. Can you define that? And where did it start from? Where the origins? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's normal guilt that we should have when we do something bad. Mm -hmm. it, it motivates us to straighten it out, say we're sorry, whatever we need to do. But toxic guilt is when you live in like a chronic state of guilt okay. or you take something to a person and apologize or you take it to the Lord and you confess it and you still carry it. So that isn't like normal healthy guilt anymore. That's what I would call toxic. And usually, again, it starts early in life where we're not forgiven when we say we're sorry, where we're punished harshly on a regular basis, where we feel rejected, like we're not good enough. So again, these roots start very early. But I have found that lots of women live in a state of kind of chronic guilt. And so we look for the roots. You know, it generally starts with some kind of rejection or criticism early in life. And then women especially turn it on themselves. Mm -hmm. So again, we have to start to recognize the roots. We can take it to the Lord. We choose to forgive. We are not commanded to trust, but we are commanded to forgive. Mm -hmm. Because when we don't forgive, we carry it. Yes. It's toxic to us. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to carry something or somebody, drag them along with us into our future. We want to leave them in the past. And forgiveness does that. It's a choice. I tell people, if you're waiting for the feeling, it ain't coming. So it's a choice. I want to repeat something you said, because I want our listeners, because I am pondering on it. We are commanded to forgive, but we're not commanded to trust. And that is really profound uh, because that, that's true. And in, 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 in forgiveness, one of the things that people misconstrue is that you have to continue the relationship. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that you forgave somebody means you're going to trust them again, and that's not true. Mm -hmm. So that that is very powerful right there that we are not commanded to trust, but we are commanded to forgive mm -hmm. that I, I wanted to make sure that we, we made that remark, because that's, that's really deep. Yeah, I'm not sure where I learned that I learned it early in my Christian life, it mm -hmm. might have been a it might have been from a book by, I think his name was uh, Daniel Augsburger. But the idea is that people get stuck. Many times they want to do what's right, but they get stuck because they think mm -hmm. if I forgive, I have to let them do that again. Mm -hmm. No, you don't have to. Right. You right. Know? I think sometimes it's really useful if we think about how we parent. If somebody is a bully to your child, you don't tell them, yeah, go back and be friends or I don't. No. It's like, stay, stay away from them. They're crazy, mm -hmm. you know? So. God isn't, I mean, once in a while, God will call us to do something very difficult. But many times we just need to use our common sense. It's like, okay, I'm going to choose to forgive this, but I am not going to spend extra time with this person. Right. Mm -hmm. I had to do a big forgive. I forgave the person. Mm -hmm. But I say you will not be at my uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas table dinner. There you go. I don't, I don't have an angle toward you anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't have hostility, but we're not going to be like we used to be, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you set those boundaries. Oh, I learned that you set those boundaries, you know, but uh, yeah, forgiveness is really letting you off the hook because when I'm angry with you, I'm missing what I'm missing what God has for me. Yeah. When every time I hear your name or every time, you know, I see you and my blood starts boiling, I haven't forgiven. Mm -hmm. I had, and I had to learn that the hard way. But that's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And it, it can be a process. Sometimes we do it in levels and layers. But um, that's where, like you said, boundaries. It's like we're in charge of our own boundaries. So 
there are consequences when people sin against us, mm -hmm. when it's something grievous. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I value myself enough that I'm not going to let you walk all over me because I know it's going to happen again, mm -hmm. or I'm not going to let you hurt my child or, you know, whatever you need to do that we choose to forgive so that we can be at peace. And then we do what we need to do to protect that peace. Mm -hmm. I went through a pretty difficult situation about, about a year ago and, uh, there was a lot of hurt and eventually it, like, you know, sometimes grieving, it's a grieving thing almost. Um, there might be hurt at first and then maybe you get in touch with the anger. And so I kept taking it to the Lord. I choose to forgive this person. Lord, I give to you, you know, the hurt I feel. And then I decree a scripture over myself a lot of times. So I kept going back to Psalm uh, 23. You restore my soul. You. I don't need this person. I don't need to keep going back to this person. You restore my soul. And there's also a verse in Psalms. I can't think of which one it is right now. But it says, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, the the um, path is very dark. Mm -hmm. But if we decree the promises of God, I will live to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Mm -hmm. And little by little, we are restored. So sometimes it's all at once, but other times it's it's a process if there's been a deep betrayal. And sometimes we also need to come out of agreement with judgments people have made against us. A, a lot of times I find that uh, people have been labeled in some horrible way by a parent or an ex-spouse or an ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend, and they kind of like live in that label. And so um, that's like agreeing with the enemy, right? Because that comes from the devil, the father of lies. I don't care if a person said it. It really, that crap is all from the devil. Mm -hmm. So what, what we might need to say is I come out of agreement with the lie that I'm stupid. Mm -hmm. I'm not lovable. I'm crazy. Whatever label that has been assigned to us because of somebody else's dysfunction, we can actually, sometimes we need to break that on a spiritual level. And then sometimes then we can change how we talk to ourselves on that psychological level. There's so much interplay. I know you ladies know. There's so much interplay between the psychological and the spiritual and yes. the emotional. So when one thing doesn't work, you know, ask the Lord to show you the roots. Mm -hmm. Maybe the root is a little bit deeper. Absolutely. Exactly. Yep. Um, how, and, and we're kind of talking about the, the issue of between the spirituality and, and the mental health component. How does one view, one's view of God impact the ability to draw on our faith in times of crisis? Mm -hmm. So this comes up a lot. Again, we don't always think about how we, how we are viewing God or how we think God views us. Mm -hmm. When somebody else asks us, does God love you? They'll say, well, well, yeah, God loves me. But they don't live like God loves them. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you are a little bit afraid of God, if you think he gets mad at you easily or stays mad easily, then you're not going to boldly approach the throne of grace like it says in Hebrews 4. We're not really going to believe him for good things that yeah, uh, we can say, I'm too young, God won't do this for me, or I'm too old, God won't do this for me, or whatever. There's always some kind of a reason why we don't expect what we say to other people that God is good. So if we are afraid of him, if we feel like he's stingy or he has favorites, we know where we learn this, right? It starts early and it it contaminates our understanding. And so reading the Bible can help, but I have a lot of clients who read the Bible and they only pick out the parts where they feel judged. Mm. It's like, okay, so where did you first feel judged? Because it says in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation. 
So if you are living with condemnation, then you learned it someplace. You weren't born feeling condemned. Right. So again, we go back to where did I learn this? Where did I experience it? I choose to forgive them and release it and invite God to heal me, help me see him the way he is, help me understand and experience his love and acceptance. Because the words that are used in the New Testament, are they're not just about knowledge, they're about experience. So if we are not experiencing the love of God, then there's a gap between what we say we believe and where we're really living. So again, we want to keep looking for the roots, take them to the Lord, because he wants us to experience far above all that we ask or think in Ephesians 3. If we don't look for where's it coming from, it's going to be harder to get rid of. But most of us just grit our teeth and say, I shouldn't feel this way. Mm -hmm. But I don't find that very useful. I I try to look for the roots because usually I know where it, I know where mine are, mm -hmm. you know, and then just kind of like give them to the Lord. Colossians 2 talks about that we are fully alive in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's thriving. So if we are not thriving, then there's some part of us that isn't healed yet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That is so good. Um, well, one of the things, and, and you just mentioned something that, that brings me to this question, is sometimes people feel like they're not feeling good, and they give it to the Lord, but they don't look further. And um, part of, of what that causes is this stigma of not seeking help, because they confuse um, mental health problems with spiritual problems. Um, how can we educate people about the fact that seeking mental health assistance has nothing to do with not having enough faith? I have uh, two thoughts on that. One is about being passive and one is about dimensions. So don't let me forget because once I start talking, I'll forget those. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's start with uh, the passive part. So uh, this almost goes with learned helplessness, but it's not exactly the same. Some personalities are more like fighters, aggressive. I would put myself in that category. I mean, that has good things to it. It has bad things too. I'm just driven. If there's something wrong, I'm going to look for an answer. But for people that are more like compliant, easygoing, you know, those are great qualities too. But it can be more passive when something is not right. Mm -hmm. So we might be letting other people steer us too much and that's why we're not in a good place. Or we might be wanting God to do something for us that we have to take a risk if we don't like our job, whatever, that maybe we need to look for something. So it sometimes it's related to being a little overly passive or compliant. To take a step is a little bit it's a little bit stressful. It's like you don't all you don't know where it's heading, but that's where faith comes in, right? And friendship mm -hmm. comes in. It's like if you need to take a step in a new direction. Again, the scripture says you lead me in the path of life, that there are steps on the path. And so sometimes I need to take a step. So sometimes that is related to being a little bit overly compliant or passive, but the other part of it that is probably the big one is if you think about uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us that we are created body, soul, and spirit. Yes. That means each dimension is important and each dimension needs attention. Okay, so I go on vacation and I gain a bunch of weight and my clothes don't fit. So I can pray, Lord, take this weight off. But that is, that is really belonging to the dimension of the body. Mm -hmm. So probably the solutions are going to need to come from those physical dimensions of our being, exercise, eating <laughs> properly. So if we treat everything like a spiritual problem, that doesn't make sense because we're not just spirit. We are body, soul, and spirit. Right. So it's like, you know, if you need a screwdriver, but you think all you have is a hammer, so you just hammer everything. That's not the right tool. You have to address the dimension that is 
the problem. So there is overlap, but this is the biggest misconception that people of faith have. Mm -hmm. If I have a problem, I need to pray more. I need to read the Bible more. I need to beg God, but maybe we're not addressing the proper dimension. So if an issue is relational, then maybe I need to communicate a little more directly. If I communicate well, and they just don't care about what I'm saying, then maybe I need a boundary. That is one of the things that seems like a huge misconception yes. among people of faith. Yes. Why don't you tell us about your book? My latest one is Anxiety, Depression, and Helplessness, mm -hmm. Keys to Break Free. It talks a lot about learned helplessness, and it looks at the different things connected to that so that even if you don't have learned helplessness, I have a chapter on perfectionism, mm -hmm. on uh, procrastination, on uh, understanding the dimensions of personality, self-confidence. So I, I do a lot on self-talk in that book, paying attention to the things that people are often saying to themselves when they are perfectionists, when they procrastinate, and then some practical ideas about how to like work with yourself, move forward and not be stuck. That's great. That is good. Yeah. And we can see that you have a copy back there. Yes. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, we are so grateful for all this information. I think that, um, I, you've given us a, a different perspective because I have been looking to learn myself how to explain the, the difference between the issue of we all need help in different ways. And one of the things that talking to different people through this podcast has helped me see other points of view, like the, what you just mentioned about the dimensions is something I had not thought about. Okay. Um, I had, I know that we are spirit in uh, soul and body, but putting it into that context for, um, the mental health aspect of it, I had, I had not put those two together. So I, I am very grateful for, for you, for every, all the work you're doing. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper. It has really been a blessing having you today. And I've learned some stuff. I have learned to. some stuff. So uh, we're going to start. Now that we're aware, mm -hmm. we can make those changes. And I have so enjoyed talking with you ladies. You're very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. You're very warm and engaging. Thank so you. we're very grateful to having us with you. And God bless you. God bless you. God bless you too. Thank you. Bye-bye.